Peppermint, Bonnie Milligan, and Taylor Iman Jones. Keep it going. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. Hello. Hi. Yes, I think we can pretty much end after that amazing video. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> um, tickets done. available. Uh, perfect. <laughs> um, welcome to Google. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. We're so excited to have you. Um, before we get started, just let's go down the line. Um, we'll start with you, Bonnie. Just tell us about yourself and your character in the show. Sure. Um, I'm Bonnie Milligan, and um, I... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, Bonnie Milligan, I'm making my Broadway debut doing the show. <laughs> Very exciting. And uh, I play one of the princesses in this royal family of Arcadia, Pamela. My name is Taylor Jones, and I play her royal handmaiden in the show who has a bit of a crush. Back at ya. <laughs> I'm Peppermint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. no. No. no, you're not. Uh, I'm Peppermint, and I play Pythio, the oracle, in the show. Yes. <laughs> And it's my Broadway debut as yes. well. <laughs> Believe me, we are going to talk about this. This is amazing. So, and it's all it's all of your Google debuts. Yes. So it is. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. in person. Yes, yeah. amazing. <laughs> I You're use on, Google all the time. Yeah. I don't know. That. <laughs> Every time you say it, we get 10 cents. Yes. So keep saying Google, it. Google, 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 Google. Um, so this show just gave, I mean, it really just gave me so much life. And, and seeing you three on stage is just like a, such a delight. Um, let's, let's just start by talking about these Broadway debuts. Um, Peppermint, obviously, you are making history as the first out trans person to originate a role on Broadway. Which a mouthful. Like... <laughs> <laughs> I practiced that before. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Um, I mean, what's that like? What was you know? How did you get involved with the show? And, and just how does it feel to? You? <sighs> uh, it's a dream come true. I mean, to make your Broadway debut is is so. Um, I'm on cloud nine hundred, and. Uh, and it's, it, you're right, it is an historic moment, and I don't take that lightly. Um, it just feels so great that I had the opportunity to audition and actually, you know, the, the, the drag gods were in the world, in the room when I auditioned and, and I got the part. Um, and initially I was just excited to be on Broadway, but then I had a chance to read more into the script and obviously meet the fabulous cast and just the entire, um, experience has been great for me. And then I'm also really happy that there is this historic moment and not only my casting, but also in the character. And that's not lost on me at all. Yeah, tell me a little bit about the character and how you sort of created this character. How you interpret, you know, the character. I didn't create the character, but. No, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean like how do you create the character? Oh, okay, the originate. Yeah, yeah. Originate. Um, uh, well, the character is Pythia, who is the Oracle of Delphi, who has, if, for those who come to see the show, a few different connections to each cast member in the show. And I guess it's important to say that the show is essentially about a family on the run, uh, 
on a journey of self-discovery, to say it very quickly. <laughs> and so the oracle is, is instrumental in that and gives some um, key prophecies that are kind of dooming. And so uh, the oracle themselves identify, identify as gender non-binary. And so that's, I think, an historic moment as well. Um, I've never heard of any Broadway characters um, self-expressing as non-binary. And so uh, getting into the role, I mean, luckily the non-binary part of it is not very daunting for me. Mm. Um, just obviously having dealt with my own issues of gender and kind of exploring that myself. But on top of it, the there's something kind of mythical and mystical about my character in a very positive way. Um, and they're very empowered and they're very powerful and in control uh, at every moment in the show, um, which is, I think, rare a lot of times for queer folk and especially, especially gender nonconforming folk who are oftentimes the butt of the joke, killed off way too soon or just like this mythical being like a unicorn, which is lovely, but we're more than that, obviously. So it's, it's great to have kind of a full circle moment. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I mean, we will talk about representation because I think it's, I mean, for, on, on one level, just seeing the three of you here on the stage, just such fierce and, and talented. Mm -hmm. uh, Gore, you know, amazing. Go, honey, what, I no, you get, say gorgeous, what? Oh, okay. <laughs> I have six pages of it, honey. Okay. okay. Um, no, we I'm, get paid every time you say gorgeous. Okay. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous. Gorgeous, gorgeous. gorgeous, gorgeous. <laughs> um, so representation on that level, I think, is just like really beautiful. Bonnie, we've we've talked about sort of like um, representation as a person of size. Yes. Can you talk about like your song Beautiful and Well, I get to be the beautiful princess and everybody on stage like agrees and says yes. Like I'm not a butt of a joke, which is sadly revolutionary. She's the most beautiful princess the most beautiful. in the whole land. And I have um a love story, spoiler alert, with Taylor. And <laughs> it it is something that um you you don't get to see plus size people a be on stage without being like, um, I don't know, explained why you're there in some kind of way with like, well, she's struggling through her self-worth or some kind of fat joke or something. It's just not there. And you have like hairspray, which paved the way, but it, been, it was about her size and overcoming it. And Margaritaville, there are different things where we talk about the size. And this is the first time, I think, in a Broadway musical where you have a plus size woman being the beautiful girl on stage and having a love story and falling in love. And it actually, the lesbian love story is just filled with joy and discovery. And um, we're, we're, we embrace it and everyone on stage embraces us, which is also sadly revolutionary. Um, so I love representing all that and giving more voice to lots of people. Yeah, I mean, what I love about the show is that it takes these sort of tropes, um, you know, Elizabethan language and characters from from the 14th and 15th century, and queers them and sort of like, you know, in a very hilarious and and smart way. But like, it is looking at the show. It's it's a very queer show, um, and there's queer love, which I think is beautiful. Um, Taylor, looking at you like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the you know, just talk to me a little bit about the the sort of like. The, the love stories in the in the show and like what does that mean to have a queer love story represented on Broadway or and many queer love stories like what what's that like for for all of you I think one of the coolest things about our show is there are many love stories and none of them are really gender based at all mm -hmm. like everyone's in love with someone else and they either find out it's not what they expected or it is what they expected or they don't care whether it was what they expected or not. And I think that's what we, we have a character who's dressed in drag for a lot of the show. He's a male dressed as a female, but the king and queen both find themselves attracted to this person. And along with the young princess is attracted to this person, no matter who they are. And I think that's really important and feels so cool to be a part of and to get to share that with everyone. And like you said, have people at the stage door see themselves on stage finally in a positive Celebrated. way. Yeah. yeah. I want to ask about the reactions to the show. Peppermint, obviously, hello, season nine of RuPaul's Drag Race, yes. which you were, you know. Oh, season nine, runner up of RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, is there a crossover in, in the audiences of, do you see a lot of Drag Race fans coming to the show? And There must, I think so. Yeah. Yeah, Drag Race is so mainstream now. 
Um, so there's definitely people, at, especially at the stage door, which is really the opportunity to meet people who obviously have seen the show and ha hear what they have to express. And a lot of them say, I watched you on season nine and I'm getting to see you here, which is great. So yeah, um, Drag Race is a, is a nice little intersection. Mm -hmm. you know? When I saw the show, um, Sasha Velour was there. Oh, right. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Have other uh, Drag Race sisters of yours come, yeah. come through? Yeah, and a whole bunch more are coming. Oh. This, uh, I think DragCon's coming up. Oh, yeah. So there's oh. going to be plenty. But um, yeah, Sasha was there, uh, Bob the Drag Queen, Thorgy Thor was here recently. Mm -hmm. Carmen. Yeah, they've all, Carmen, yeah, they've all come to, to support. Oh, wow. And hopefully enjoy. Which is super great for us. <laughs> super great for us. <laughs> um, I think this is a good time to take a pause. Thank you, uh, Thank Taylor you. and Bonnie, for joining us. Um, they will be back at the end of the show to uh, treat you guys to a... To episode. kill you. <laughs> yeah, to kill you. <laughs> With their voices, I With shouldn't <laughs> say that. <laughs> High security. <Got> <laughs> To slay you, perfect. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to invite up. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Please give them a hand. I want to. It's my pleasure and honor to invite up um, a number of leaders and activists from our community um, to have a discussion about exactly what we're talking about, representation, um, identity. So please um, give a big, big Google welcome to um, Rain Dove, um, to Chase Strangio, and Gina Rosero. <laughs> yes, perfect. So just to quickly give, give bios, and then I want to hear from, from all of you. Um, Rain, you were just on the cover of Vogue Italia. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We will talk about that. Um, and you're a model, a longtime model in New York. Mm -hmm. um, Chase, you are at the ACLU. You are the first out trans person, uh, first out trans attorney at the ACLU. Is that right? I mean, that we know of. That we know sir. of. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and Gina, hey Hi. Gina, um, <laughs> you're a model, a producer, and founder of media media advocacy group Gender Proud. One more big hand for all of our. Friends. Yes. You. You. Um, so we've we've sort of been talking a little bit about um, about identity and, and sort of representation, and I want to I want to sort of open by um, posing to to the group here, like how does your identity show up in your art? Can we talk a, a little bit about and and you talked a little bit about this as like, but I, I would love to hear you talk more about you know, does your identity as a as a trans woman? inform your your identity as a performer? Um, let's start there. Yeah, uh, for, for a long time, um, my drag, I've been working in New York as a drag queen for 20 something years. And so for most of that time was before I'd really medically transitioned or even like mentally transitioned. And so for the longest time, expressing myself as Peppermint the Queen was the only access that I had to people affirming kind of this feminine, female, this womanly identity that I created. And so my drag character persona um, is really just my trans identity kind of heightened. And for the longest time, that's all I had until, you know, eventually I was able to, you know, kind of wrap my head around more and able to kind of, I don't want to say separate the two, but really cement my, my own identity, my own self every day as a trans woman. And, but I, all the while I kind of transitioned underneath my drag persona. Um, so she, Peppermint, the drag queen kind of protected me mm -hmm. from people judging me about why am I wearing this clothing or why you still have makeup on and are you going to a show and all these little questions that I would sometimes get and, and also for myself, it allowed me kind of the space to see, my, see me as I, to, to create myself, which I had already done as a queen. And so, yeah, um, my, my art, my first art, which is my drag, and I'm still, I still work as a drag queen, um, definitely has, is 100% made up of everything that's peppermint. <clears throat> oh, wow. So do you think that, I'm just interested in this idea of like 
you're using your drag as as a protection and as a shield. Mm -hmm. Like, do you, was that a conscious thing for you? Like, were you aware of that while it was happening? Oh yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah. In many ways. I mean, I knew that I wanted to. I felt fabulous, and I wanted to wear these women's clothing, you know, mm -hmm. and 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 strut myself. And obviously, you know, I have a joy and love of performing. So drag is was the perfect calling for me. And there really wasn't any, there weren't any other realms. There was no other Broadway roles that were being written that were supportive of trans identities um, or even gender non-conforming anything, really, you know, in my experience, especially as a black person auditioning. Mm -hmm. um, there, it just, it was pretty shallow and, and narrow, I should say. So I created this drag persona to kind of include everything that I always wanted to be. And I knew that for me, the the kind of fantasy of Peppermint, the drag queen, was just everything I always just wanted to be, how I want to be seen. And if you if I can't access that in any other way, then I'll do it on stage and I'll get paid for it. And people are gonna clap. And that's kind of what I started it out as, you know? Wow. Uh, yeah, Jim. I wanna add something about what Peppermint was saying about uh, protection and um, and that persona and creating that whole identity for us by us because it's more than protection it's survival right I mean for so mm -hmm. long we really needed to find our, our way to to for us to find platforms for ourselves for us to express ourselves and uh, to find those safe spaces I mean for me personally I was born and raised in the Philippines we have this culture in the Philippines of transgender beauty pageants that happens during the most traditional Catholic religion, tradition, irony, it's not lost in me, but we, 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 we did it, so it's part of our culture. So in a way, growing up as a young person, we needed to find those ways and avenues to, to express ourselves. So these trans beauty pageants that happens all over the Philippines, you know, th this is how I first learned about myself at 15 years old, this is how I first learned how to you know, really get to know about who I am and surround myself with a community that loved me and supported me and I found my chosen family. So just to build up on that, you know, finding ways to protect ourselves is also a way to survive and also building off to that as, as, as people, as communities, to, serve, to thrive as a community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned chosen families. I just want to talk a little bit about that. I mean, there's this idea in the queer community that we, as queer people, um, often get to choose our families and the people that we surround ourselves with. Can you just talk a little bit more about what that means for you? And, um, and this is, and, you know, Chase would love to hear from you too about how this shows up in your you know, in your activism and your and your legal work. Yeah, I mean, just going back to to the initial question and <coughs> and thinking about well, what does it mean to show up as ourselves in our art to sort of be the a, a disruption of the expectations that are that are often imposed on us? And so I sort of like the idea of thinking about law as art because we're narrative storytellers as lawyers. The work that we're doing is always engaging with culture. And so if you take you know me showing up in my body and being public about that, making it visible. Um, you know, it's, it, I was assigned female at birth. I don't have a very masculine, traditionally masculine presentation in the courtroom or anywhere else. And that is very much a disruption to the gender normative structures in the courtroom and in the law. And I think the law doesn't really allow for nuance. It's it, it tries to box people into binaries. It tries to tell people that they can't live intersectional, nuanced, complex lives. And so if we if we cede that terrain to our opponents, to the legal structure, then we're never going to make space for people to survive and step into their existence. And we have to be really careful about, especially in sort of conservative and repressive political climates, really giving up on the idea that we have the power to tell our own stories in all the different places that, that we show up. And, and naming our bodies and naming our truth is in and of itself a, di a disruption that is dangerous for many people, particularly people of color, particularly people who don't live in binaries, people who are bisexual, people who are non-binary, people who are people of color, um, who whose existence is a threat to, to the power structures that exist, you know, it is it is imperative that we name the complexities of our lives and, and step into spaces where we're not expected and allowed to be. Um, and so that's how I try, you know, as a lawyer to walk into the courtroom and to tell stories 
of my clients and myself so that we aren't erased from the power structures that try very hard to erase people. Yeah, I want to, yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally hear you. And I think like just on that, on that sort of piece of naming, right, and claiming your, your own identity and, and personhood, like Rain, I heard in an interview, um, you, you said you identify as gender non-believing. Oh, no, it's not gender non-believing. Um, <clears throat> my identity is I am I. So I don't have any language. I allow other people to use whatever they feel is fit. Um, you know, we're born into language, and that language is tailored to each person specifically. It's a unique experience. In order for language to work, you have to have an understanding of the history of the sound, you know? Um, and if I said the color red right now, I guarantee everyone has a different shade in their head. So <clears throat> I don't police other people's language for me. When um, people, like I always say, a pronoun is just a sound, and all I'm listening for in that sound is positivity. Um, so you can use she, he, it, one, they, whatever you want to use for me um, is appropriate. However, for some people, like for me, that's ultimate freedom. I just, I'm in this little flesh bound thing. We don't look like ants. Um, and even ants look different under a microscope. So why are we comparing each other? Why are we homogenizing each other? It doesn't make any sense to me. However, for some people, finding their identity and having that label and having that kind of stability in that thing, it, it's, it's their freedom because they had to give up so much, their families, their careers, their lives, they, maybe um, even lives of others, in order to be able to say, this, this history, this, this history of this word is a thing that I want to be. Um, so I don't, um, I don't police the way other people identify themselves either. And I don't see other people as pr imprisoning themselves. Um, in my work, um, <clears throat> I talk about gender as like gender capitalism. The idea that we've weaponized this division in society, he and she, um, as something that you can capitalize on and make money off from, and sometimes even have advantages given to you. So a lot of my art actually goes around um, comparative photos. So I just really did um, an experiment with domestic violence. I went onto the New York City subway trains, and um, I presented as societally very masculine, and then society very societally very feminine. Um, and then I had two other people with me, and we yelled at each other on the train, culminating in a slap across the face. When people perceived that there was a female yelling at a male, they'd be like, girl, you get that guy, you get him, you get him, oh boy, you're in trouble. But the minute that guy raised his voice, um, people would literally grab me. They would grab me. They sometimes would even hit me. We have a couple of times where somebody was like, bro, you need to chill out, and they hit me. Um, and when I did it where it looked like the same two genders by societal perception of what is male and female, people just took out their cell phones and recorded. And it made it very clear that it is actually more advantageous to be a female in a public situation um, in which you are, um, you, know, you need help. Whereas in, in a, in a, if you're a male, um, people tend to sit back a little bit more. And with same sex um, or same gender presentation, um, we just don't have enough education to be able to identify when somebody's being abused at all. People just didn't know what to do. Um, so, I mean, th that's the kind of experiment I do. I take like the videos, I show side by side. Um, just like, it's, it's just, I was born into this body, but by identifying with one or the other, why do I deserve less? Why do I deserve less? Because I might have more here, or I definitely have more here, you know? Um, it doesn't make any sense to me. What's your experience been uh, in, in modeling and in fashion um, you know, have you, ha, what, what's, what's that space been like for you uh, as you've been sort of in the community for, for years? Like, mm -hmm. how did you, how did you sort of enter it, navigate it, and how does it sort of play out for you now? So basically, in the modeling industry, it's one of the few industries in which, um, men make more, uh, make less than women, by far. Um, and I model as everything, whatever you put me in. Um, in the, in the industry, I find that, um, there's a lot more protection for women for sexual harassment. So when I do male <clears throat> perceived jobs, um, is there water? Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, but when I do male perceived jobs, um, I tend to find that people want me to take off more, they want me to expose more. And for male portfolios, actually there's a lot more nudity. But it's something we don't talk about because men are supposed to be more comfortable with their bodies and men are supposed to be able to stand up for themselves. Um, 
However, with um, a lot of the women's stuff, the clothing that they want you to wear, the garments, even the heels can be absolutely crippling and damaging. And it's so brutal. You walk into a room, people will flat out say, you're fucking ugly. Why did you even come here? This is a women's casting. P come here when you pick a team, you know? Um, and the women are very competitive with each other. So they, they tend to put you down a lot. Um, behind the scenes because it is so intense. So the women, you know, they're hungry, they're told to lose weight. I'm actually up right now for, I just really got the Louis Vuitton runway show and campaign. But, mm -hmm. I think, yes. I was, I'm very excited, but it turns out it's the women's show. And they want me to lose 15 pounds before September 5th. Don't drink any more water. <laughs> 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 I've lost six total, and that's as far as I'm going to go. Um, and they can fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I, but, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I really wanted to like point out, Gina, because, I mean, Gina, you've been in this industry a lot, too, and you know, like, it's intense, it's brutal. Yeah. No, I wanted to just put context to what Rain was talking about. You know, it's important to understand also what had happened for so long. I mean... I mean, personally, I, I now produce uh, documentaries, web series, um, and stories that center the narratives of the most marginalized in, in our community, specifically trans women of color, especially created by a trans woman of color. For me, that was very important, very critical, both for representation and the nuanced storytelling. For so long, I was born and raised in the Philippines, and I moved to New York in 2005 to you know, pursue my dream uh, to be a model. And in 2005, there is not an out trans identified fashion models. So it's important to have the context that we're having now for, for so many people when they see what's happening now in fashion, gender non-binary, gender fluid, all that stuff, like that was not the case three years ago, four years ago, right? Yeah. So when I moved um, in New York City in 2005, I made the decision to not share to my model agent that I'm trans, acknowledging that the degree of privilege around that. Because for, for so long, I've had this, um, there's many women pioneers to, who came before me, women like Tracy Africa Norman, Carolyn Cosey, Lauren Foster, and many women who paved the way for me as a transgender model that when they got found out, their careers basically disappeared. Mm. So in a way, they were, they, were, they were both a sense of possibility of what could happen for me, but also a sense of fear that like, oh, if I actually come out, that's, that's, when, that's what's going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. So I was you know, working as a model for about 10 years, and you know, I was working, doing commercials, cover up magazines. But every time I would go home, I would always feel so scared and so paranoid that, oh, the New York Post, page six, will find out I'm trans, my career would be over. So I was living in paranoia. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, obviously, things that has changed when it comes to media representation, but after almost 10 years of doing that, I've had enough, so I made the decision to take ownership of my story. I wanted to tell the world and come out to the world, so I decided to come out on a TED Talk and in 2014, and even just 2014 to 2018, so much has happened. I feel like it feels so long ago because all of a sudden this conversation of gender, the Time Magazine, Laverne Cox, what we see on, on, on media right now, posts being you know, written, created, starred by trans people of color, centering the narrative, so much has happened, right? So it's important to understand the context in which where we're at right now. Certainly, there's so much more that needs to be done, but it's important to understand that there's so many people, especially the pioneers, who have suffered, basically, for paving the way for so many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk about coming out, and your TED Talk, Gina, I think is, is really beautiful. Everyone should go watch it. Um, it was titled, uh, Why I Must Come Out, and something about that word must just sort of struck me. Um, so I, I didn't title that talk, by the okay. way. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's important to even have that, you know. But certainly, you know, I, I now have a different understanding of this word of coming out, you know, because, you know, what does that really, for me, growing up in the Philippines, I, I knew I was, you know, I came out to my mom when I was wearing my T-shirt on my head, telling my mom, mom, this is my hair, this is me coming out at five. I came out again at 15, started joining pageant. Certainly, it, you know, you, we want to have this nuanced conversation about these words, right? Because we all deserve that, you know, sure. to have those conversations, especially the cultural context in which all of these things kind of plays a Place apart. Certainly in 2014, so much is happening. I mean, 
Chase and I were actually, we haven't seen each other in a while, but we were even just talking about when did we meet? When did we actually, and we actually met around 2014 because a lot of, a lot of things are happening in 2014 as we all could remember. It's, you know, Time Magazine said the tipping point, obviously that's something to argue about, but you know, this word of coming out, what does that really mean, right? Well, and also just to, to build off what Gina's saying and what, and what Rain said, like we all have a responsibility to understand that gender is a system that we're all complicit in. And it, it leaves some people imperiled by the system and others are, are benefiting from it. But the very concept of coming out is predicated first on an assumption of cisness and an assumption of, of sort of monosexual identity. And so it's, if we're not calling it the question of, well, well, what are we all deploying every day as the signifiers of gender, of, of, of the assumptions of sort of a bodily coherence? And even, you know, even the head over heels plays on this because it assumes that if you hear the word vagina, you think woman. You hear the word penis, you think man. But those are political choices that we're making that then situate very particular bodies in, in, in vulnerable ways. And we have a responsibility to unpack that because yes, a lot has happened since 2014, but I can tell you as a parent of a kid, we're not doing a very good job of dismantling gender. <laughs> we're actually doing a catastrophically terrible job and we're all responsible for that. So I think we should really pay attention to how our language assumes things about other people, um, both in terms of their bodies and in terms of their attractions to others and who's left out by that um, because it really does have life or death consequences and I think we're all very much responsible for, for building up those systems. Well. Yeah, I mean, I, I love what you said about coming out and just sort of like, the, just, you know, taking, to, taking that, that idea and sort of turning it on its head a little bit. I'm interested though, what that, how that sort of plays out in the public. I mean, Peppermint, you came out, you sort of came out um, very publicly on, on Drag Race, um, but were, I, I just wanna understand like, what was your relationship, what is your relationship to coming out? And like, let's start. Let's start there. Just as Gina said, it, it's it's an ongoing process. It's something um, that you do over and over again because coming out really is, for me, it's just telling people more information about myself that's always existed. Mm. And so, just as Gina said, there could have been many moments where. I revealed something about myself that would have been very telling about my identity, whether I was a child or an adult or what, regardless of what language I was using. And so, you know, yeah, it's funny, a lot of people read um, and who, people who are fans of Drag Race who hadn't known me personally will say, oh, you came out in 2016 as trans. And for them, and I guess for a lot of people, when you hear that, it means that's when I transitioned, realized personally, you know, for myself who I was, and that's not the case. You know, I've, I've been living as a trans woman publicly since 2012, right. and I just wasn't on TV. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I needed to, I felt the need to have a, have a conversation with the people who were in the room alone, with, well, alone with cameras. <laughs> and, and, I, and I didn't know these humans, so I wanted to talk to them about um, my existence, but it was more than just me saying, guys, I have something to confess about my sh shame. It wasn't that, it really was in the context, as Gina was saying, of transness and how it meets and intersects and supports drag and always has. And there's far too many times, there's a lot of people who, just as Rain was saying, people want you to make a choice. You know, are you trans or are you a drag queen? Tell us which one so we'll know. And A, it's none of their business, but B, it's, um, you know, I don't see the two as incongruent. It's a job. I'm a woman and I have a job. Why do I have to choose between those two things? And so, you know, that's the coming out thing is, has always been an interesting kind of, language because I always feel the need to qualify and explain it like, yeah, I came out on RuPaul's Drag Race, but you should know that's not really what it, I didn't come out. Mm -hmm. I did, but I didn't. So it's, it's complicated. I think there's a sense of, I think the word that's, that's the through line is sense of ownership, right? Mm -hmm. Because when we talk about media and like media that's being created, whether it's in a Broadway show or, or a TV series or anything, right? A web series, whatever that is, there's a sense of ownership that like when trans people declare ourselves, 
initially the reaction is like that you have to even validate yourself even more you know mm -hmm. like you're not believed that you are this because for so long especially uh, american media it's it's predicated upon this thing of you know, you, you, you don't own that, that identity because people were not exposed to it. Can you believe, like, I found this out, like, about two months ago, Jerry Springer was just canceled. So it's been on for that long. <laughs> I mean, it's I really, still it's with all like crazy. So I was, you know, born and raised in the Philippines when I moved to, um, the, the U.S., you know, we had transgender beauty pageants on national TV in the Philippines. It doesn't mean it makes it, you know, it's such a progressive, accepted place. But we have this very mainstream media representation where, you know, people go to church, they go home, they watch a trans beauty pageant. That's what they did. That's what we did. But then when I moved to the U.S., the first representation that I saw on, on mainstream media was Jerry Springer, which is oh. all about, like, you're this, you're horrible this, a man, woman. I was just like, whoa. You know, for, and for so long, American media is predicated upon that, you know, that we don't own about our identity. So all these things that we're always having to validate ourselves is because it's think of, of ownership. Obviously, mm -hmm. here we're speaking about it because we are who we are, you know, we don't need to go deeper into, yes, we're educating, but we don't need to go to validate ourselves that we are this human being, obviously we are. Um, but, you know, I think that's, I think that's a lot of the things and representation that's happening right now, whether it's in Hollywood, whether it's like who gets to produce stories about trans people, documentaries about trans people, or like who gets to play a role, you know, trans um, roles in Hollywood and any of these content that we're seeing. So obviously there's a lot more to go, but the nuanced conversation is everything. But certainly as someone who produces content and stories, you know there's a big difference when there's a trans person or gender nonconforming people behind Mind. Not just in front of the camera, but behind the scenes. I mean, recently, Rain was part of a documentary that I did with uh, Logo and VH1 about the history of transgender models. That when I was doing that project as an executive producer, I, I couldn't believe that I was doing that because for so long, the, the representation, I, I got to invite Tracy Africa, Norman Lauren Foster, Crimsona Kayser. These are the women that I've mentioned before that paved the way for me and sort of bring them to the conversation and take that, to give them that space of ownership about their stories that for so long they were denied because they got outed. That was the media landscape for so long. So I think this sense of ownership about who we are, our, our, our abilities, our, our, our talent, it's important to, to understand that. I'd like to build on that a little bit, if I might. Is that a thing? Yes, we sh you should build on it. We just want to um, open it up to questions. So if you yeah. if you have questions from the audience, please line up at one of the mics on either side. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. No, of course. Um, yeah, so, I mean, first of all, I was like, am I supposed to be here? Because I don't identify as trans. However, a lot of times people who fall within, like, the like the non-binary spectrum are seen as um, people within the trans community. But I do experience a lot of transphobia. And um, it was a really important thing, I think, that you did. Um, it was really amazing. And just to, I just want to build on the idea of people behind the camera. Um, right now, um, I just want to put a big like warning out to everyone. There are a lot of advertisements. It is popular to have diversity in your ads right now. But just because you see diversity in the ads doesn't mean that they're doing good things. You really have to research the products that you you're buying because you might say what I'm buying isn't just a great product it's also making me feel good because I see rain or Gina or peppermint you know on these um, on these like ads but they still support animal testing they still support factory sweatshop labor they still use palm oil they still use things that deforest the rainforest um, people are trying to use our anguish our frustration, our marginalization, and the feel-good Cinderella story that someone finally sees us to sell us something that is a beauty product that has ugly practices. And I really do want to encourage you all, like, if you take something away from this, it's to ed just continue to educate yourself and really do the work. There are some really great apps that can scan the barcode um, or even, like, the UPC code on all products. So if you have a favorite product, you can just use the app, and it will tell you where it sits on an ethical scale. I know it might be a little bit more expensive for ethical products, but that is the cost of a clean conscience. And we really have to invest the money in people who truly want to invest it back in us. Yeah. Thank you. We have a question over here. Thank you guys for coming. Um, I want to know what you guys think about how we can raise the next generation to kind of approach this subject in a better fashion. I heard one of you at least as a parent, how would you raise your kids, basically? 
Um, <laughs> well, uh, let's examine <laughs> your parental skills. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, no, I mean, I, I think that in you know, in general, um, it's it's so easy to be. First of all, caretaking is hard labor that it disproportionately falls on women and people who who are femme identified for a lot of reasons, and also people of color. If you walk around a rich white neighborhood in New York, you'll see lots of people of color caring for older people and younger people. And I think we have to be really conscious of like the white supremacy that's at play in our caretaking in general. So I just wanted to say that um, because that just is always strikes me in New York. Um, but but then it, you know. I just think we have to be really conscious of the fact that gender is a system and that every single day we are gendering people and behaviors and that there are costs and consequences to that. And so if if we can do anything, it would it, my sort of goal is to urge us to stop assuming coherence of bodies. So for example, my child doesn't have a concept that body parts correlate to genders. It would make no sense because my child has seen me naked. And that just, I can't be like, oh, a penis is a boy thing, but your dad doesn't have one, you know? And so that, you know, being really conscious and naming our bodies and then destabilizing the idea because if we think about the violence against trans and non-binary communities particularly femmes of color um, women and femmes of color it's based on the idea of a betrayal of the truth of a body that doesn't line up with people's assumptions and if we don't start to get rid of those assumptions we're gonna keep seeing this violence um, and, and just to go back to, to Gina's point about representation you all may not have consumed Jerry Springer but I bet you watch Silence of the Lambs or Ace Ventura or The Crying Game and these are predicated on the idea of oh my god there's a penis and oh my god that's so shameful and and our kids still internalize that because we are participating in the idea that bodies are coherently gendered and that gender is not a system but a biological truth and if we don't move away from that then I think we're just going to keep entrenching the binary and keep making it harder for people to survive and that's on all of us listen to your language how often you say ladies how often you say dudes how often you say girl parts boy parts how often do you assume that people you know in the in the men's bathroom stand up to pee at a urinal what are the ways in which we're <laughs> we're participating in this and imposing that on a younger generation um, and the people that we that we caretake um, because we all do it. Although we do it too, 100%. It's a lot of work, but it's a worthy endeavor to do, you know, certainly because it affects everybody, so. Yeah, you've been brainwashed since mm -hmm. birth to use a particular <laughs> type of language. I still make mistakes, actually. I preach this thing of like, we need to drop and change our language, but I still make mistakes all the time. I say dudes yeah. a lot or like, Hey man, what's up? And that comes right out of my mouth. It's this like natural thing. So it, it it's not something that happens overnight. <clears throat> yeah. Um, thank you for that. I, I want to go back to something you said, Gina, about um, sort of who gets to play the roles, right? right? Like who gets to write the stories and tell the stories. And Peppermint, obviously, you are. I'm writing all. The You're writing all the stories. <laughs> I've written them. This all. is the next show. <laughs> As the storyteller for, you know, <laughs> <Yes>. for history, <laughs> for humanity, <laughs> if only. <laughs> um, no, I just, I just kind of want to ask that question of, you know, what is it, what does it mean for you to be a trans woman playing a, you know, a sort of like non-binary role on Broadway? It means everything, and it, and even bef just before that, it was even though I've been doing drag for twenty years. I was made to feel after so many of my contributions and hard sweat, blood, sweat and tears in the drag world in New York City, sometimes earning $50 a show, tra traipsing to the to the bar, um, and you know, having to take the subway home. After all of those dues that I feel that I paid, I felt that I didn't have support and marching across the Brooklyn Bridge for marriage equality, showing up for AIDS and HIV, um, research and education and prevention events and giving my time to charity, which I think charitable work is a huge part of drag for me. After doing all those things, I felt that I didn't have a single friend or ally in any single one of those spaces when I was dealing with the my tra for sorting out my transness. I didn't feel that I, my jobs would, would be protected. I worked seven days a week in bars and clubs, and I was in the room when a very popular queen who uh, had since transitioned and was kind of sorting all that out. I was in the room when the when the manager of the bar was like, "Well, let's fire her because she's a trans woman now." 
as if she doesn't have rent to pay in New York and maybe medical expenses. And, and so that, was, that terrified me that I would have to choose between the two. And the reason why I really went so strong into drag was because I went to college for musical theater perfor performance thinking that maybe I'd have a career on Broadway. And there was none of me represented in any of the rooms, in any of the scripts. And so I, I, in school, I was told that I would have to butch it up and have to, you know, at best you might be able to play a handful of characters that are written as black gay guys. And none of those people were leads. Mm -hmm. and, and so, not that that was what I was seeking, but just to have um, the, a, a, an existence and being able to earn a living in Broadway and then also as a drag queen on a major platform seemed impossible to me. And I was faced with the very real thought that I would have to, if I wanted to do anything more than pay my rent, which is exactly what I was doing with those seven jobs, seven day a week jobs, I would have to investigate and consider survival sex work. This was just three years ago wow. that I would not be able to continue my medical transition or do anything more, have a dollar to spend more than my rent. After working seven days a week, I'd have to engage in survival sex work. And that was the only option that I thought that I had before auditioning for Drag Race. And even then, no one was saying, come do Drag Race, you're a trans woman, we'll put you on. No one was saying that. I just, I had auditioned several times and I just said the last time during the audition, I'm just gonna do my thing. I probably won't get on, who cares? And obviously I got on. And so I didn't really, to answer your question, I didn't um, envision any possibility that I would ever be on drag, on drag race, on, um, on a Broadway stage at all, let alone a principal and playing a character who is, who is, self-aware and self and reassured and confident in who they are and a very real character in that way. And representation does matter because when I was growing up, the closest I had to seeing myself was Richard Simmons. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's that. So I, I, I'm so happy that we have uh, shows like Pose among other things that are bubbling up. And then that I have this role on Broadway, which is rare now and it feels so good to be, to have a, a, a moment in history. But it, it also, at the same time as everyone on the panel has said, it also reminds me of how little opportunity there has been for, for people like me and including myself. And so, yeah. Did I answer the question? <laughs> <laughs> has your, has, so has the publicness of this role and of, you know, your time on Drag Race, has that changed your sort of like understanding of allyship and like your feeling of, of allyship at all? Yeah, I mean, not those things alone. I think the times changing has, has clearly helped. Um, I think for so long, um, we'd be remiss by not acknowledging that drag queens and trans folk and gender non-conforming folk have always been connected to the queer community, obviously, but gay bars and nightlife. And I would entertain in Chelsea and in Hell's Kitchen, primarily gay white male audiences, every single night, giving my all every single night, all those seven nights. And then, you know, not one, I just didn't feel like there was any understanding at all or any sense of responsibility or any acknowledgement that there is a privilege that even gay white men have, even though they are a minority and we are a family within the queer community, there are moments where, and certain things that I will never have access to and certainly in the past have never had. And so it was very upsetting to me to march across that Brooklyn Bridge for marriage equality. I'm not getting married. And even if I were, my partner would not be seen for who he says he is as a heterosexual woman. You know, a lot of people would attack my partner for being gay. And even I've seen gay guys in, in the presence of 
my partner or trans women's partners say, oh, you're really just gay. You know what you like, we, we just come over to our side. And so I, that feels like a betrayal. And then um, in 20, I think 2013, Elon uh, Nettles was one of many trans women of color to be murdered viciously on the street. And there were uh, several visual, vigils and kind of um, public moments that, that were had. And I went there and not, there were no people from our community uh, that I could see. There certainly weren't any, a lot of white faces or gay white faces that I knew of that were there. Um, and that felt like a betrayal as well. Like, I'm a part of this community. I've been entertaining you. You know who I am. And if I were murdered, would you show up? And that's a real thing, you know? Yeah. So ally, but it's changing because I'm hearing conversations that are different. <laughs> this conversation helps. But also, I just want to say, I mean, you, you're now put in the position to say this. I want to say, like, as a white person, I want to call on, like, the white queer community. Like, we consume the, the black and brown labor and then don't show up. And, you know, Peppermint has been putting herself out there and educating folks and, and dancing and performing for people. And then to not show up, like, what is that? And what does allyship really mean in our community? Because the LGBTQ community is horrible at not showing up for each other and that especially when it comes to bi folks, trans folks and non-binary people, we erase and exclude and then benefit from their labor. So I just wanna say like, we can stand here and congratulate ourselves. Yes, we're doing better, but not good enough. And the fact that three years ago, Peppermint you know, could not afford to basically survive is a indictment of how much work we have to do internally. And I just wanna say like, you shouldn't have to name that, but I, I feel like we should hold that. Yeah. Wow, I mean, what, you know, thank you all so much for, for this really um, beautiful and, and important conversation. I wish we could go all day. Um, please, I hope we can continue the conversation just, you know, as a community um, and, and that we take this with us out of this room. Um, and for those watching at home, just really just really take, take these words with you. Um, and yes, so before we close, we do have a, please, please give them a round of applause. Thank you for being here. And follow them on social media. Can we get, should we get handles real quick? <laughs> yeah. Peppermint247. Perfect. On all, on all platforms. <laughs> Uh, Rain Dove model. I, I, Rain Dove was taken. Someone took it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Chase Strangio at, on Twitter. I'm Gina Rosero. That's G E E N A Rosero. R O C E R O. Get into it. <laughs> <laughs> I love a good plug. Okay. Um, so um, thank, thank you all again. We are going to welcome back um, Bonnie Milligan and Taylor um, for a final performance. Taylor thank Iman. you. Taylor Iman Jones. It's 
It's the perfect consolation prize. A little piece of blue. It's an automatic rainy day. It's an automatic rainy day. And when you see the reaction you cause, doesn't make you sad. It's an automatic rainy day when I see you. It's the perfect consolation prize, a little piece of the love. It's an automatic rainy day. It's an automatic rainy day. It's a rainy day. Bonnie Milligan and the fabulous Miss Anne Klein. Keep it going.